Right here. I've been out for over a month here with some pretty serious um, infection issues, but I'm finally back and I know so many patients have been asking and viewers have been asking for me to talk a little bit more about secrets of what happens to your body under anesthesia. And that's why I came on here. Uh, I'm so happy I have my voice back. So I'm going to place this phone down and we're going to jump right into it because I know there were so many questions you all had about what happens to your body under anesthesia and the secret potential that patients have even when they're asleep. So this is an operating room. You can see the lights. I think you saw the table here in a little bit, uh, or you saw it there. As people are trickling in here, uh, I'm really happy to see you guys. It's just been a long time that I've been sick and I really hope that we can all learn a lot here. Um, I got all your comments up here, so you can ask away. Catherine, good to see you. Um, Tina, Tina, about POTS. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, and Teresa, Chris, Rebecca, excellent. Let's learn. Um, and hey, Darlene, I'm happy you came over on TikTok. That's great. So Tina, Tina is asking such a good question about POTS and anesthesia. Uh, I don't have time to connect myself to the monitors to show you guys what POTS looks like, but it's when your heart rate races out of control and it can actually be very dangerous under anesthesia. Why is that? It's because when you're under anesthesia, let me show you. This is the ventilator. This is the anesthesia gas here, this yellow thing. You guys can see it says SEV backwards here. This can make POTS symptoms be even more exaggerated than they already are. But, but the good news is that we have so many medications that we can give intravenously that act immediately to help counteract the side effects of not only the POTS, but also what the anesthesia does to exacerbate the POTS. So Tina, Tina, just tell your anesthesiologist and you will be in good hands, I'm sure, if they understand the POTS pathophysiology, which any board certified anesthesiologist certainly will. What I do, by the way, is that I actually wear um, compression socks because I hate to have, I'm wearing, I think this is watermelon today. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, anyways, because that also helps counteract those side effects from the POTS because it helps prevent fluid from draining in the wrong areas. Okay, paradoxical effects of caffeine. There are a couple um, in that they can cause panic attack-like symptoms when patients are under light anesthesia, or even when patients are asleep when they've tested this out. So um, I don't actually use it in my practice because I don't need it to wake patients up. Sometimes in neonates in the pediatric ICU will use caffeine to help prevent children from being apneic or from stopping breathing. Okay, great, so many other questions. Uh, Rebecca, it's so good to see you on here. Yeah, I'm also sad that I've missed so many because I've been really sick for a while, but I'm back now. Um, Teresa had a G, J tube change go very badly, ended up intubated and also aspirated. Oh my gosh. Well, for everyone who heard what Teresa went through, first of all, thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. Teresa's talking about one of the most dangerous things that can happen when you're sedated or under general anesthesia. It's called aspiration. It's when the contents of your stomach come up and you actually vomit and because you're asleep, you can't control the muscles in your throat like your epiglottis to just swallow the vomit back down or to vomit it out. It goes into your lungs instead. It can cause what's called an aspiration pneumonitis or an aspiration pneumonia. So. Um, I'm so sorry you experienced that. It is why I'm so serious about my patients who come into this room here. When you're on this table here, you better have not eaten for at least eight hours. That's why I take it very seriously. Um, guys, everyone, send Teresa some positive vibes for feeling empowered to share that story. I know it's not easy. Um, by the way, a little shameless plug on my end. If you're learning stuff, hit that like button and um, subscribe to keep up with all my videos. I just filmed one about... Uh, <laughs> what surgery and anesthesia teaches us actually about um, the corporate world. I don't know if you guys know, but I speak to businesses and associations about the return on investment of mental health because, you know, it's a huge deal in the operating room here, but it's an equally big deal in the business world where the healthier you are, the happier you are, and the more money you make, which is better for you and for your employer, which is like, why don't the employers support your health so that you're happier and make more money for everyone. Anyways, 
I just finished filming that video and I'm so excited to edit it. Hopefully it'll go up in the next couple of days. Um, okay, so reviewing the questions, we talked about POTS. Oh, Danny R., can you talk about genicular nerve ablation? Danny R., I have not done one personally. Are you re referring to the genicular nerve around the knee? Let me know and then we will um, talk about that. Okay, why do you get swelling in the cheeks with steroid meds? Rona Miller. Steroids in general cause water retention, which can cause your whole body to get kind of puffy. It can also cause fat to not be distributed normally in the body, usually ends up behind the neck, can also go around the face. It's called moon face. Um, we don't have good, um, sorry about that. We don't have good treatments for that. It, steroids are one of the necessary evils of medicine. They're incredibly powerful when needed, but when used for an extended period of time, cause all, they wreak havoc on the body. In particular, we're talking about the fat distribution. So we don't have any good um, treatments for that, except to address why do you need the steroids in the first place. Sometimes you can find natural remedies to prevent the need for the steroids in the first place, but treating the side effects of steroids is very complicated. There are some natural steroids out there that have more gentle side effects, but often they're not enough if you're taking high dose steroids for a serious condition. Okay, uh, Steve. During anesthesia residency, when do you attend classroom lectures to learn all the pharmacology used during anesthesia care? Uh, Steve, we had to learn that a lot uh, at home. Uh, I think we had about maybe something on the order of like three hours a week of lecture time in residency. This was years ago for me, unfortunately. <laughs> but a lot of it was learning, learning at home. Okay, they can't use fentanyl in the anesthesia because I get a bad side effect. Brenda, I'm sorry that you had a bad side effect of fentanyl. It is quite rare. Um, if you, I'm happy to share more about why some patients get that. Just ask your question below if that's what you want to talk about. Catherine Marco, good to see you. Iris, good to see you. Hunter Blake, what kind of doctor am I? I'm an anesthesiologist. I'm also an integrative medicine specialist, so I do the natural herbs, the uh, mind-body techniques outside the operating room and in the operating room like where we are now. We do the hardcore pharmacology, the breathing tubes, the ventilators, like what I'm holding here. And it's an elegant mix of Western Eastern medicine. Um, okay, Teresa Lynn, they did a chest x-ray after your aspiration. I have gastroparesis. Okay, so Teresa is talking about, God, who here has that gastroparesis? Have you guys heard of gastroparesis? Let me know below, because this affects so many patients who probably don't even know about it. And it breaks my heart because it's really rough and like no one talks about it. It's kind of like EDS, really rough and no one talks about it, right? Um, so let me, let me know below if you've heard of that. Um, yes, it is Pikachu by the way, Teresa. That is a Pikachu <laughs> tone. Um, if you guys are learning something, do please hit that like button and share what you learn with others because it helps me do this more often. Your support means a lot. Um, as we continue to share more knowledge and grow the audience. I really appreciate your support. So gastroparesis is when your stomach here cannot push food out of it the way that stomachs normally do. So the vast majority of human beings are gonna have all of their stomach emptied out after eight hours. So it's squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Eight hours later, it's empty. Gastroparesis literally means a paralyzed gastrum or a paralyzed stomach. It cannot squeeze properly. We often see it in type 1 diabetes or some other conditions that we don't quite know why they cause gastroparesis. So um, I'm sorry to share that, Teresa, but that's why we have extra high precautions here in the operating room, right? In this operating room, we got to be super careful. If a patient has gastroparesis, I take it very, very seriously for exactly that reason. I'm so happy that your chest x-ray did not show a serious pneumonia or pneumonitis. Danny, um, okay, oh, Danny has, Danny, oh my gosh, Danny, we were just talking about EDS, right? We were just talking about how EDS is so underappreciated, Danny, it's exactly what's going on. So a genicular nerve ablation can help reduce the pain, it's kind of a band-aid for blocking the pain that's felt around the knee. It doesn't treat the underlying cause of the pain, but it can be very helpful if it lets patients get back to walking and doing their daily activities. So even though it's a band-aid for the knee pain, if it helps them get back to the daily activities, it might prevent other diseases, especially in an eight-year-old 
we want, we want to make sure that they're not excluded from physical activities with friends and age-appropriate behaviors that they would otherwise be doing. Uh, okay. Tizippi Klein has gastroparesis. I'm so sorry, Tizippi, and um, you know why I take it so seriously now, because it really needs to be known. Um, yeah, Teresa said, <laughs> you're twins. Why do we vomit after anesthesia? Nikki Lim, three reasons why. So important. Number one is anesthesia itself causes nausea. Number two, pain causes nausea. So the surgical pain can cause nausea. And number three, it's the intense anxiety that can come up can also contribute to nausea. So anything that we can do to reduce any of those three, like nerve blocks, spinals, or what I do, calling my patients the night before surgery, can help reduce nausea. Great question. Um, if you guys are learning stuff, please hit that like button and share what you learned with others so that you can empower yourself and those that you care about. Okay, um, Teresa, oh, median arcuate ligament syndrome. So that's um, a little bit more involved there, Teresa. I'm so sorry, but I hope that you're in the care of a good primary care doctor who can help coordinate all of your care. Um, Summer is an integrative medicine PCP. Oh my gosh, Summer. Well, I'm so happy. Thank you for the work that you do. I hope everyone here appreciates what Summer does. She is such an important type of doctor that we just don't get enough of. So everyone here, send some warm vibes to Summer, uh, or Dr. Dr. Summer, Dr. Vanshoff, for caring so much about our patients to look outside the box for the solutions that we don't always learn in traditional Western medical school. Uh, Brenda, thank you for the kind comments. Amanda, good to see you. Teresa, have I ever done a celiac plexus block? Uh, it is what some anesthesiologists do. I have not done one. It's not within, a, I, I'm not a pain uh, specialist. I do nerve blocks all over the body, not there. That's a very dangerous one that not every uh, anesthesiologist should be attempting. All right, I think we got about four more minutes. Does propofol make you vomit? Um, usually no, usually propofol is the anti-nauseating one. Um, the gas is making you nauseous. I had pituitary surgery and it was a success, says John. I'm so happy it was a success. I wonder if they did it transnasally uh, or through the nose there, through the cribriform, um, relatively minimally invasive. I'm so happy it went well, John. The concern we have in anesthesia is whether there's any in, uh, hormonal imbalances, acromegaly, Cushing syndrome, etc., when someone presents with a pituitary tumor that has to be removed. Um, Danny R. One more question. Can I talk about anesthesia for EDS? Yes. Okay, guys, we'll end with Danny's questions. I got to run after this. Um, oh, BDI number one handles propofol well. Good. Very good. So, oh, Danny R. I'll get to your question in a moment. Summer, Dr. Summer is sharing an anesthesiologist saved my life when I went into cardiac arrest in an emergency C section. Oh my gosh. Summer, thank you for the kind words. I'm sorry that you had cardiac arrest. Uh, pregnancy is one of the most, um, uh, I gotta say this, pregnancy is one of the few wonders of the human body in that it is a window to your future, right? Very few things are predictors of the future in medicine. Pregnancy is. When patients have complications in pregnancy, things like hypertensive problems, gestational diabetes, even low birth weight children, that predicts that that mother has a higher risk of having heart problems in the future. Dr. Summer, I'm not saying that's you, but because you shared that, I hope everyone appreciates just how powerfully and empowering pregnancy can be for us to take control of our health. Okay, Danny, EDS and anesthesia is so important because we don't quite understand why some patients with EDS have so many complications with anesthesia. One of them is because the connective tissue problems, meaning that the skin and the muscle, they're not quite formed normally in patients with EDS, and that causes problems with us injecting anesthesia. Things like epidurals or nerve blocks don't have the same success rate in some, not all studies, in patients with EDS. So if I'm doing a nerve block for your shoulder surgery, I am gonna be a little bit more mindful of how I do it and making sure to test that it works because your connective tissue might not expand and accommodate the medication I'm injecting because of the connective tissue disorder. Um, hey, Christina, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, uh, 
Catherine Marcotte. I'm so sorry that you also have a pituitary tumor. Um, Cindy. All right. I promise that'll be the last question and I do need to go, but um, oh my gosh. Cindy, we will talk about that next time. What happens as my patients are waking up? It's an incredibly informative moment about that patient. How their mental health in some, not all cases, in some. Because the more relaxed they are before they fall asleep, the more relax there when they wake up. So patients that wake up with extreme panic and fear, I'm concerned about what their mental health is going to be like following surgery. You know, that night, the following day, are they at higher risk of a rebound for depression? There's a lot that can be determined and predicted based on that. But we still don't know much about it because it's an understudied part of medicine. Okay. Um, uh, Teresa, Hannah. Okay. Hannah, I just want to end by addressing your point. In a surgery room without gloves is not an issue if there's no concern for sterility. We do many things in an operating room without gloves, and it's perfectly safe for patients. The phone is also no evidence to suggest that having a phone is harmful to patients' sterility or infection risk. If you find studies that suggest otherwise, I would love to see them, but I routinely do it because I do nerve blocks in an operating room. I use my phone for my ultrasound, actually. No evidence to suggest that it is dangerous to patients. Okay. Um, Madison, I'm so happy that you had hip surgery on Wednesday and that you're alive. I hope that it went well. Um, and Hannah, uh, no, not at all. It's not sterile. Hannah, many things in the operating room are not sterile, including actually everything in this room right now. Nothing is sterile in this room. But when the patient's in here, we need to ensure sterility of everything going into the patient's wounds. So nothing in this room is sterile right now. I mean, I could lift the floor for, you know, for example, I'm not gonna do that, but it's not sterile. This bed is not sterile. The phone is not sterile. The breathing tube is not sterile. Uh, the mask is not sterile. The ventilator is not sterile. None of this is sterile. The, the bag is not sterile. None of the corrugated tubing is sterile here. Very few things are sterile, and it's a very important distinction to make. So Hannah, thanks for, thank you for raising that. Um, and I'll end by saying, Catherine, can I do a whole surgery with only propofol, no gas? Yes, it's what I like to do because it's better for the patient. It's better for the environment. I do it all the time. I did it today, actually, for a hip surgery. Hannah, well, well then you had to put it in hot. Uh, I'm not following. I'm not following, Hannah. Um, Things that go in the patient have to be very uh, have to be treated beforehand. That's true, but most of the things in this operating room are not going into the patient. Therefore, they do not need to be sterile. Okay, I'll end by saying, Madison, I'm happy that you're doing better. I'm sorry you were scared, but I hope that um, your recovery goes well. And I don't appreciate that comment. That's not very kind, because that's um, I, I'm a little bit concerned about where that's coming from. It seems a little bit malicious, and we don't like to have malicious comments here. Um, I hope everyone is, is going to uh, have a good weekend here. Hope you all learned something. Remember that you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told, even here in the stressful operating room environment. So if you learned something, share what you learned with those that you care about. Um, and if you don't mind hitting that like button and um, <laughs> subscribing to keep up with um, all the videos that I put out, it would mean a lot to me to help me do this more often. I hope everyone learned something. And thank you all who shared your personal experiences. And uh, Dr. Summer, Dr. Vanshoff, thank you for what you do. Take care, everyone.